In a previous video, we looked at Norway's choice of the British Type 26 frigate for their future fleet. We talked about how that decision was all about commonality and interoperability, with Norway opting for a design that would be near identical to the Royal Navy's own ships. It's a pragmatic approach, focusing on a shared platform. Well, today we're heading south to take a look at another major customer for the global combat ship which is the parent design of the Type 26, and that's the Royal Australian Navy. Whilst both Australia and Norway chose the same parent design from BAE Systems, the path the Aussies have taken is completely different. The Hunter class frigate is a bespoke beast, heavily modified for Australian requirements, and that choice has created a whole host of challenges. So let's have a look at the Hunter program its unique design, the serious troubles it's faced, and the massive strategic pivot the Royal Australian Navy has had to make because of it. The Hunter class is a heavy frigate, with a full load displacement of 8,800 tonnes. That's 800 tonnes more than the Royal Navy's Type 26. Its primary mission, above all others, is anti-submarine warfare. Australia's defence strategy recognises that by 2030, over half of the world's submarines will be operating in the Indo-Pacific region, and these ships are the frontline solution to that threat. In fact, the name Hunter was chosen specifically to embody its role as a submarine hunter. To accomplish this mission, the Hunter is being built with a unique and advanced combat suite. It features the Type 26's acoustically quiet hull and an array of world-class sonar capabilities, including the 2150 hull-mounted sonar and the 2087 towed array. But perhaps the most significant part of the design is its combat system, which combines the US Navy's Aegis Combat Management System with an Australian-developed CEA phased array radar. This blend of proven US technology and cutting-edge local innovation is meant to give the Royal Australian Navy a truly formidable capability. The Hunter's armament includes a 5-inch Mark 45 Mod 4 gun. The ship's surface attack capability may also be enhanced with the Naval Strike Missile, which is planned for a future integration. Alongside MU-90 torpedoes, and an integrated surface ship torpedo defence system. For close-in protection, the ship is fitted with a close-in weapon system and short-range guns, along with the Australian Nulka missile decoy system. Now, here's where the debate really heats up. For a ship of this size, the vertical launch system count is just 32 cells. That's surprisingly low. The Hunter's 32-cell Mark 41 looks even more interesting when you compare it to the Royal Navy's Type 26 frigate. The British design carries 24 Mark 41 cells, but it also has two dedicated 24-cell silos for sea scepter missiles. The Hunter appears underarmed compared to other large frigates, and this is where the costs of Australia's bespoke design really show. The large 8,800-tonne hull which is 10% more than the Type 26, is required to house a substantial power-hungry combat suite, combining Aegis and the CEA radar while still maintaining the extensive acoustic quietening needed for its primary anti-submarine warfare role. The weight and electrical power consumed by these highly complex bespoke systems effectively used up the design's reserves, meaning that space weight and power were directly traded for this advanced technology, preventing any additional VLS cells. It is also responsible for that pineapple mast, which, how can I put this, gives it a unique look that sets itself apart from the Type 26. The Hunter program has become famous for its litany of problems. The most glaring issue is the astronomical cost initially projected at around 35 billion Australian dollars the price has surged to a staggering 45.6 billion this figure would make the hunter class 
program one of the most expensive surface combatants in the world. Then there are the persistent delays. The program was already behind schedule due to issues with design maturity, both in Australia and with the UK's own Type 26 program. This resulted in an 18-month delay to the first ship's construction milestone. Although steel was finally cut for the first frigate in June 2024, the expected delivery date has been pushed back to 2032. Most of these delays and cost overruns are a direct result of the design challenges Australia took on. An internal report reveals that the bespoke integration of the Australian and US systems has caused the ship's weight to grow substantially beyond the original design, as we mentioned earlier. The increase in weight and complexity has, in turn, led to critical technical issues with power and cooling, with the ship's overall power demand exceeding its generating capacity. The procurement process itself has also come under scrutiny. An Auditor General's report criticised the Australian Defence Department for failing to adequately assess whether the project provided value for money and pointed to a lack of documentation explaining why BAE's bid was chosen over rival designs. The audit noted that BAE's proposal did not meet the basic pricing and payment requirements laid out in the tender. Defence officials nevertheless went with the BAE design, knowing it was high risk because it was the only one that fully met the high-end anti-submarine warfare and mission system requirements. Crucially, the decision was heavily influenced by the fact that the Hunter programme was designed as a foundation for the government's continuous naval shipbuilding program, an essential goal to establish sovereign shipbuilding capability in Australia, which defence officials stated was a key factor in assessing overall value for money. This situation reveals that the problems with the Hunter are not simply a result of mismanagement, but are a direct, foreseeable consequence of the strategic decision to pursue a highly customised design. Australia chose the most capable ASW platform on offer, but in doing so, it accepted massive costs and schedule risks to build a sovereign naval shipbuilding capability at home. This brings us to a crucial question. Is Australia right to accept these massive costs and delays to pursue a sovereign naval shipbuilding capability? In a world where global tensions are constantly on the rise and with the Indo-Pacific becoming the focal point of naval activity, there is a powerful strategic argument for self-sufficiency. Relying entirely on an overseas supplier makes a nation vulnerable to changing geopolitical priorities and supply chain disruptions. By building the hunters at the Osborne Naval Shipyard, Australia is ensuring it controls its own destiny, securing local jobs and guaranteeing that it can repair, upgrade and even accelerate its naval fleet without needing permission from a foreign power. It's a hugely expensive bet, but one that the government has clearly deemed necessary for long-term national security and industrial self-reliance. The pursuit of a high-end bespoke warship built at home came with a crippling price tag. These massive costs and risks, combined with an independent analysis of the fleet, has forced a major strategic re-evaluation. That review ultimately found that the original planned fleet was suffering from a massive budget shortfall and was unsuitable for the evolving strategic environment. The Royal Australian Navy had to face facts. It simply couldn't afford to rely exclusively on just a handful of these expensive high-end warships. The result is a major pragmatic shift to a new two-tiered surface combatant fleet. The plan now is to build six hunter-class frigates instead of the original nine. These six will form the elite high-end tier one, acting as the fleet's primary anti-submarine warfare specialists and air defence platforms. To fill the gap and provide the fleet with more numbers and general purpose flexibility, 
the Royal Australian Navy is also acquiring 11 new general purpose frigates. And the winning design for this tier 2 is the Japanese Mogamai class. By choosing the Mogamai, Australia gains a proven off-the-shelf design, promising a much faster acquisition timeline and a cheaper unit to fill the capability gap left by the hunter's delays. Furthermore, the selection of a Japanese design deepens the security and industrial relationship between Australia and Japan, two key allies in the region who are increasingly aligned in their response to growing naval activity. The Magamai's smaller crew requirements is also a critical factor, as it helps address the Royal Australian Navy's ongoing workforce crisis. The pivot to a two-tiered fleet is a direct consequence of the hunter's problems. It is a public acknowledgement that the original plan of a single class was unsustainable, and it represents a major pragmatic shift in naval strategy. So, with the Royal Australian Navy having settled on a new two-tiered fleet, it's worth looking at the ships that will make up the class. The first three frigates of the Hunter class have already been named. They'll be christened HMAS Hunter, HMAS Flinders and HMAS Tasman. The journey for these ships is set to be a long one. As we mentioned, the construction of the first frigate, HMAS Hunter, began with the cutting of the first deal in June 2024. She is currently expected to be delivered in 2032. Following HMAS Hunter, the plan is to complete a new ship every two years. If all goes to plan, the entire class of six frigates will be in service by 2042. This is an ambitious timeline, and it's one that the Royal Australian Navy will have to keep a very close eye on. Australia is now on a two-track path. The Hunter programme continues its slow, expensive march to deliver six of the world's most advanced ASW warships, while the Mogamai programme is being fast-tracked to provide the numbers and flexibility the fleet so desperately needs. It's a story of a navy that has bet on an ambitious high-end programme faced the predictable consequences and was forced to adapt. Do you think that this two-tiered approach is the right one for Australia? Or should they have gone with a simpler, less expensive design from the beginning? Please let us know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching.